I'm Chris. I work at Microsoft on the Fabric customer advisory team, which means that I spend half my time advising customers how to use Fabric, which is kind of self-explanatory. The other half collecting feedback, which is why I'm interested in anybody using Fabric. Come and find me later. I would love to talk to you, especially if you're using Fabric in production. I want your feedback. But tonight we will talk about Direct Lake mode in Power BI in Fabric, which I think is the killer feature of Fabric, which I also think our competitors and maybe even some of our friends are slightly worried by. So what is it? Why should you use it? What's the benefits of it? How does it work under the covers? All will be revealed in the next 45 minutes, or maybe a little bit longer if I go a bit too, but too a bit over. All right, first of all, let's understand the absolute basics of this thing called direct lake mode in Fabric and Power BI. Like I said, this I think is gonna be the most interesting thing about Power BI inside Fabric. As Ian already explained, Fabric is Power BI. Power BI service is now the Fabric service. You can think about you know, Power BI is to Fabric as Excel is to Office. It's just that the Power BI service has now got loads of cool stuff in it. We're gonna to touch on some of those other cool things tonight, but this is all core Power BI stuff. So what is direct lake mode? Who's got an architecture like this for Power BI? You've got your data sources, you extract data from the data sources, you load it into a relational database, data warehouse or something. Maybe it's Azure SQL DB, Maybe it's Synapse, maybe it's Snowflake or BigQuery or you know, Databricks SQL Warehouse or, or something like that. And then from there, you load it into Power BI. Why do you do that? Well, Power BI likes to connect to relational databases. You can connect it to files, but it tends to be quite slow to import data from files. And you know, it's generally better to load it into a, a relational database before you get into Power BI. So, Things have been like this for, for years and years and years. Now, once you've got your data in your relational serving layer and you've, you've got Power BI and you build your semantic model, what used to be called a data set, you then had a choice to make. You had to think about the storage mode for your semantic model. You had two choices. You had import mode and direct query mode. Now, import mode, of course, involved taking the data from the relational serving layer and copying it into Power BI's own in-memory column store database engine, the Vertipack engine. Now, that was great because it gave you the fastest query performance. Everything worked super fast. And generally, this was the default choice. The problem is that you had to take all of the data from your relational database and copy it into Power BI's in-memory column store database engine, which meant that every time the data changed, you had to refresh your semantic model, which could take quite a long time. And yeah, you can do incremental refresh and things, but that could be quite tricky to set up. And also that refresh could take time. So there was a bit of latency involved. Now, you know, we live with that, but it, it's not perfect. The other option, of course, is to use direct query mode where you didn't copy any data across. But you know, when your Power BI report ran, then the report ran a DAX query against the semantic model. The semantic model translated that DAX query into one or more SQL queries, assuming your relational database spoke SQL, um, got the data it wanted from the relational database, brought it back to the semantic model, stitched it up together, did all the calculations, and then gave it back to the report, which meant there was no refresh, which was great. You weren't limited by how much data you could load into your semantic model, but performance was usually a problem. Now, you know, we've got things like composite models where you can mix and match import mode and direct query mode, we've got things like aggregations, which can help as well. But those are the two fundamental storage modes, import mode and direct query mode. move forward to the world of fabric. In the world of fabric, everything revolves around one lake. One lake is the place where all of your data gets stored. You can store data in any format in one lake. 
but we particularly like Delta format, which is an open source file based format. So you copy all of your data into one lake inside Fabric and you store it there in this file based format. And then you can just build your Power BI reports, your semantic models on top of it and make use of this new format or this new storage mode called direct lake mode. This is where things start to get exciting. Because direct lake mode is a third storage mode with Power BI. It is something genuinely new and different. And it combines some of the best bits of import mode and direct query mode. It gives you performance that is similar to import mode. It won't be exactly the same. Reasons we'll understand a bit later, but it is generally very, very close to import mode. But you do not have to refresh your semantic model. Well, you do, but the refresh doesn't actually involve copying any data into the semantic model. It means something different in the world of Fabric. So we'll talk about what refresh actually means, but there is no waiting around for your semantic model to refresh anymore. You build your semantic model and you can start building reports immediately on top of it. There's no sitting around for several hours for your you know, semantic model to refresh. So this is why people are excited. It's got the query performance of import mode without the sitting around waiting of import mode. It's got the lack of latency of direct query without the sitting around waiting for your queries to run of direct query mode. Why is it like this? Well, the reason it gives you the best of both worlds is that what it does is it loads data on demand. Direct lake mode is very, very similar to import mode, except, like I said, you don't have to refresh the semantic model because when your report runs and a DAX query runs against the semantic model, the semantic model is initially empty. But the semantic model looks at the query that gets run against it. And it says, well, I need this table, you know, this column from this table, this column from this table, this column from this table. And it automatically loads those columns into memory. How can it do that really quickly? Well, like I said, in one lake, if you store your data in the preferred format, which is the Delta format, Delta uses Parquet under the covers. Parquet is a column-oriented file format which happens to be very, very similar to the way that import mode stores its data in memory. So what the clever people on the analysis services team realized is that rather than sitting around waiting ages and ages to import all the data from your source and refresh your semantic model, because the data is stored in Delta in Parquet format on disk, we can just have a peek inside those Parquet files choose the columns that we want. They're already pretty much in the format that we want. We transcode them, turn them, load them into memory super quickly, and bingo. You've got the data you need for the query that's run. It takes at most a couple of seconds to load all of that data into memory. It's like refresh on demand. It just loads the bits of that delta table into memory when you run a query, and it holds them in memory and it might page them out a little bit later in case it you know if it feels like it but basically you can think about it as being import mode but it refreshes just the bits it needs and it refreshes it on demand so that's what's going on under the covers in order to use it you need a fabric capacity or a premium capacity and you need to have fabric turned on so if you're a Power BI admin, I hope you've all gone and turned on Fabric for everybody. Well, maybe not everybody. That, that might be. I would love it to be turned on for everybody. But for the kind of people we've got here, you want to turn it on for everybody here. You can limit this to um, individual users or security groups. So please go away and do that. 
Um, if you're a capacity admin, but not a tenant admin, you can still turn on fabric because we've kind of allowed you to do that if you're just a capacity admin. And your Power BI admin is you know, not very helpful. So you need fabric, it needs to be turned on. You can get a trial capacity really, really easily. Now, semantic models is still a thing. And if you're going to be developing your semantic models, there are some things you need to understand. You cannot develop a semantic model in direct lake mode in Power BI desktop yet. We're working on it. So that will come at some point in the future. Right now, you've got two choices if you want to develop a semantic model that uses direct lake mode. You either need to use the web based editor that you've probably already seen that's in the browser. Or you can use tabular editor two or three. Now, I'm going to do most of my demos with a web based editor. There are a couple of things that are possible in fabric semantic models that are not actually available to do yet in the web based editor. Things like setting up row level security is possible on a direct lake semantic model, just the web based editor doesn't support that yet. So for that, you've got to use tabular editor. But for the majority of stuff, you can just use the web based editor. So let's see how it's all done. All right. Oh, come on. I hate it when it does this. I will remember not to close the PowerPoint. There we go. All right. Remind me not to close the PowerPoint deck. I have here a fabric capacity. And I have a data flow. This is data flows gen two, which is the new flavor of data flows that's available in fabric. But you know, it's a data flow. If you've seen a data flow, there's nothing much here. I am loading a really small table into a lake house. So there's my table. And we look down here in the data destination. I am loading this table of data into a lake house, into one lake. All right. So there's my table of data. And here's the lake house that I've loaded this into. We have a look inside this lake house. There's that sales table. We'll get a preview of it in a moment. Now, I've loaded a table in Delta format into a lake house in one lake. Here, I could do lots of things. I could start running SQL queries. I could use a notebook. If I go over to the SQL endpoint over here, this is where I could start running. SQL queries if I want it. But hidden down here, if I go to the model view, I will start to see something that's very familiar to anybody who's a Power BI developer. This is the web based editor. Now, every time you load data into a lake house, the lake house automatically creates a semantic model for you with all of the tables in that lake house. You can go and build your own semantic models if you want with a subset of these tables. You can have as many semantic models as you want, but you know, at this point, we will just say here's the default semantic model that is created for this lake house. And there's that sales table that I had before. I can build relationships here. I could build a measure here. So let's add a new measure just to prove that this is a semantic model. And oh, wrong one. What? There we go. That's the right shortcut. And let's call it total sales. And let's sum. All the values in the sales column. Nice bit of DAX. Hit enter. There we go. And there's our measure created. So 
as a default semantic model. And I've got a button up here saying, let's build a new report. Uh, let's hit that. And my sales table is over on the right. All right, we'll ignore that. Hopefully that's not going to cause too much of an issue. Let's drag a visual on here. Ask for total sales. Now, a little bit of a delay there. I'll explain what was going on, but part of what was going on there was the data being loaded into memory. There's some other stuff that was probably more contributing to the delay, which I'll talk about in a moment. But the data is starting to be loaded in demand in on demand. There we go. Just added country there. I built a report. So at no point did I actually have to physically refresh that data, that semantic model. It just pulled the data in on demand. And as I were I used, like you were able to see, I was able to build that semantic model with the web-based editor. So Pretty cool. Let's understand what the benefits of Direct Lake are in a bit more detail. So this is cool, but you know, why would I want to use it? What's it going to give me actually? First of all, think about the overall amount of time it takes for you to get data into the hands of your users. What is it that takes time? Well, you know, you've got your source data and you've got to load that to your relational database. Maybe with some transformations. And then after that, you've got the time to copy and import the data into the semantic model. So, you know, think about it all end to end. Think about all of this. What's the difference between that and Direct Lake? Well, you know, you still get your source data. You've still got to copy that data into one leg. So you've got to do that. The next thing is, well, I don't have to refresh the semantic model anymore. There's going to be a little bit of a hit at query time, but that's kind of on demand and that's going to be spread out. So that is possibly only ever going to be a couple of seconds spread out over the time of lots and lots of different DAX queries. Now, what does this mean? Obviously, on-demand loading is going to be super quick. So the real question is, is it faster to copy the data into one lake? Or is it faster to load the data to my relational database and then import my semantic model? Well, generally speaking, based on experience with real world, it is faster just to move your data into one leg. Now, there's stuff that has to happen. It's not necessarily a straightforward copy because there's you know, things happening as well as any transformations you might do. But based on kind of internal tests with our own internal BI teams at Microsoft, you know, we've seen people say, well, their overall end-to-end -end kind of time to user has gone down from about five hours to two hours. So there's some pretty substantial savings. It turns out that the options you've got for copying the data into one leg are generally a lot faster than the options you've got for A, copying the data into your relational serving layer, which could be quite fast, but then doing that import mode. So you can get the data to your end users faster. That's pretty good. Another aspect of this, if you're using premium today, you will know that everything you do in premium uses capacity units. And if you look in the capacity metrics app, at you know, what's eating those capacity units, semantic model refresh is very, very expensive in terms of capacity units. Yeah, it, it gets smoothed over 24 hours, but even then, if you've got lots and lots of semantic models that are refreshing, that can all build up. You don't have any refresh with Direct Lake. So you're going to be saving a lot of capacity units, which then might mean, as we heard, you can you know, do more stuff on the same capacity or just have a cheaper capacity. Again, salespeople might not like that, but you know it's going to save you money because you're not doing any refresh. Another aspect of this, 
that relational serving layer, it costs money. It's complex. Somebody's got to care for it and feed it and pay the licensing and all of those things. Now, if you've got a data lake, and who's got a data lake? Lots of people have got a data lake. Maybe a few people have got a data lake. You've already got data in your data lake. Why do you need that thing in the middle? Why are you paying for Synapse or Azure SQL DB or Databricks SQL Warehouse or Snowflake or BigQuery? You just copy the data into one lake. And yeah, you're going to pay a bit of money for that, but the money you pay for doing that is going to be a lot less than whatever you're paying to have that relational serving layer run. So it can save you money. It can reduce the complexity, fewer moving parts. You can see why competitors start to get worried about direct link because it makes that layer redundant in a lot of cases. And there are other side benefits to this as well. Now, this isn't really strictly to do with direct lake or whatever, but you know, we've just seen you copy your data into one lake and you've got your semantic model and your reports and everything. But once you've got your data in one lake and you've got a, a lake house, for example, on top of it, well, you can write SQL queries against that now. SQL queries free. Well, not for free. You've got to pay for the SQL queries, but you've got SQL queries there. You can do data science, you can use notebooks, write Python, use Spark, do all of the other cool stuff on top of that data. You know, the data that you're loading in is no longer kind of locked in inside, you know, the Power BI Vertipac engine because the Power BI Vertipac engine is just this kind of thin layer now. The core is the data held in this shared open format that lots of different workloads can use, not just Power BI. The fact that you've got all your data stored in one lake leads to another really interesting aspect that is, I think, kind of super useful from a Power BI point of view. When you've got your data stored in one lake, build lake houses and things, and you know, we just saw I've got a workspace there with a lake house that I've loaded some data into. But there's only one one lake, and you've got a lake house in one workspace, a lake house in another workspace, a lake house in a wo another workspace, you can create what are called shortcuts to tables in other workspaces. Now, I've got a workspace, I've got another workspace somewhere else, and there's a dimension table that I want to reuse. I can create a shortcut to it. It's a reference, I'm not copying any data, but I can create a shortcut to that table and then I can reuse it inside my semantic model. Let's see an example of this. All right, so let's go back to my lake house. We won't bother saving that. And let's go back to lake house view here. So there's my sales table, and it's got a product column on it there apples, oranges, and pears. Now, I know that products come in categories. I know somebody somewhere else inside the organization has got a category dimension table. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a new shortcut to somewhere else inside one lake. And if we find the right one, there's a lake house here and another workspace called Shared Dimensions Lake House, where the product category table lives. And I'm going to create a shortcut, click Next. There we go. Like I said, it's just a reference. I'm not copying any data. The data has stayed where it is. I've just created a kind of link, a shortcut to it. But now it appears as a table in my lake house. And then if I go back to my semantic model and I find a new table that I loaded in, there's sales, 
And no, hold on. Yeah, it's going to take a little bit of time sometimes to show up in the. <sighs> Usually it's instant. There we are. It's turned up. There's product categories. Glad that was quick. Come on. Let's build a relationship from product to product over here. Click OK. And let's build a new report. Ignore that. And let's grab the categories and total sales. because I've just created it. It will, oh no, it would also help if I actually click the measure. There we go, there we are. So I've got a report now based off a semantic model with you know, two tables with the relationships between them. Okay, no, that's pretty cool. But what does this actually mean? Why is it interesting? Well, think about how much time it takes to refresh all the semantic models inside your organization. You've got lots of semantic models, haven't you? They all take time to refresh. They all chew up capacity units on your premium capacities. Everybody's got a date dimension table, haven't they? Every single semantic model has a date dimension table. You know, maybe it only takes a couple of seconds to refresh, but everybody's got one. Now, in import mode, every single semantic model has to have its own copy of the data, which has to be refreshed. With direct lake mode, you copy that date dimension table into a lake house once, and every single semantic model can reuse exactly the same copy of the data. So they're all in sync, you load it once, and then you don't pay any price afterwards. So Think about all of those shared dimensions that all your semantic models use. Think about how many semantic models probably reuse bits of the same fact tables as well. Now think about how much time and money you can save just by shortcutting to all of those tables and reusing them across as many semantic models as you want. This is why this is cool. All right, so we've heard about the good stuff with semantic models. Now let's start to talk about some of the limitations. Some of these are temporary things. Some of them are going to be a bit more permanent. Um, there is a long list of things that you know, aren't supported yet with semantic models, but I'm going to pick out a couple of them and talk through them. Um, one of the first things that people run into with the web-based editor is you don't have calculated columns you don't have calculated tables in direct link mode. Now, why is this? Well, with direct link mode, you're getting the files on the disk and loading the data on demand. Calculated columns in import mode are persisted and created at refresh time. We don't have refresh time anymore. So there's no calculated columns or calculated tables, at least not yet. The answer is, don't use calculated columns and calculated tables. Build exactly the same thing further upstream when you're loading the data in. So it's a different way of thinking. Now, I know there are kind of debates about, am I going to be able to do that further upstream? But that's the way it is at the moment. We want you to build those calculated columns and calculated tables when you're loading the data into one lake. We don't support all data types yet. We're working on that, but you know, there are going to be some data types like you know, binaries and things that you can load into one lake that you can't use in direct lake mode. Um, so direct lake data semantic model, sorry, have got the same limitations as direct query mode, which means there are some kind of niggly things like if you're using analyze in Excel, you don't see hierarchies, you can't do drill through, which is a little bit of a pain. Um, and also there are some things which are maybe quite subtle, which we'll talk about in detail in a bit more in a, in a moment, which is like, you know, if you've got views in you know, your lake house or your warehouse, you can't use views in direct lake mode. Why? Because views are views. They don't exist on disk and 
direct lake mode relies on getting the data from the delta tables on disk. So those are the kind of limitations, the things you won't be able to do with direct lake mode. But there's another thing to talk about, and this is something called fallback. You can build a semantic model in the web-based editor, and you can say, well, you know, I want it to be in direct lake mode. But you might be using some features that are not supported in direct lake mode. In which case, you build your semantic model, and the semantic model will look at what you've done and it'll say, ah, oh, sorry, well, I can't actually use direct lake mode. And by default, what it'll do is it'll fall those tables back to direct query mode. Because one lake and lake house and warehouse, they've all got a SQL endpoint. You can run SQL queries against these tables. So, well, you know, if we can't use direct lake mode, for example, against a view, well, we're just going to write SQL and get the data like that way. Now, we probably don't want to fall back to direct query mode because that's when performance is going to get worse. Um, you know, it's not bad. I mean, you know, performance of the SQL endpoints for warehouse and lake house is actually really, really good in Fabric. Um, it's probably about as good as you're going to get, but it's never going to be as good as the, the kind of in-memory Vertipak engine that you get with import mode or direct lake mode. Also, if, for example, you're doing other things in Fabric, let's say you're defining security you know, you're loading data into a, a fabric warehouse which is the kind of relational database engine sitting inside fabric you can set up row level security in that now the way we thought about it is that if you set up row level security in one workload then yeah you can like you know that data will still be stored in one lake but well you set up security in the warehouse if you could just go in and use direct lake and bypass that security that would not be good so we're saying at the moment, well, you know, if you set up security in the warehouse, we're going to have to use direct lake mode against that because that's the only way that the security is going to get respected. Coming in the future is something called one security where you set up the security centrally in all workloads respected. So you set up row level security and the SQL queries respect it, Python res code respects it, you know, your direct lake data sets respect it. That is not available yet, but we are working on it and hopefully it will come later this year. That would be another killer feature, one security that people get excited about. Imagine just being able to set up road level security or column level security once, and it just magically appears in all of your Power BI reports and it's applied to your SQL queries and all your data scientists get that applied to them as well. All right, coming soon, watch this space. Now, those are the kind of functionality issues that you might run into. There's another set of issues because direct lake mode is very, very similar to import mode, which means that we do have to load the data into memory before you query it. And there are limits on how much data you can load into memory. So we have these things called guardrails. The easy way of explaining it is that if you try and load too much data into memory, if you've got too much data, we're going to switch back to direct query mode. Now, we don't want to find this when we're loading the data in. So we've got a whole series of rules that will kind of give us a good idea about whether you're going to be able to use direct lake mode. So these are the guardrails. They vary by SKU size, by capacity size. The more you pay for a premium capacity or a fabric capacity, the more data you're going to be able to use with direct lake mode. Um, there is a table in the docs, but for example, if you've got a P1, you can, you can work with direct lake mode with anything up to 1.5 billion rows. If you pay for a, an F2048, you can use, uh, I think, what's that, 24 billion rows in um, direct lake mode. I think that's quite a lot of data. Um, we also have limits on the number of rows in a table, um, the number of uh, row groups and parquet files. There are ways of investigating how many um, rows you've got in a table, row groups, parquet files. A colleague of mine, um, Phil Seamark, has something called Data Analyzer, which is, sorry, Delta Analyzer, which is a uh, notebook which 
does all of the work for you and is able to detect whether you have uh, got you breach these guardrails. But the basic thing is you probably want to know whether you've fallen back to direct query mode. And as you've seen, there are a lot of complicated rules about whether that's happened or not. How do you know whether you've fallen back to direct query mode? Well, what you want to do is peek under the covers and see what's happening inside the analysis services engine when you run a query. So how can we do that? Well, we can use DAX Studio, or if you're like me in old school, you can use SQL Server Profiler and connect to the SQL endpoint. So let's see this in action. OK, so here's SQL Server Profiler. It's a free tool. You just download it and install it. I'm going to connect to my SQL endpoint. Sorry, my XMLA endpoint, which is here. And I am going to connect to something called Fallback Demo Warehouse. What's Fallback Demo Warehouse? It is a warehouse. And if we have a look in here, I've got exactly the same table that we've seen before loaded in. It's a table. I can use that in direct mode. I have also got a view, which is a select star from that table. So I've got a table and a view. They contain exactly the same data. Tables we can use in direct link mode, views we can't. And I've got a semantic model with these two things in. So we can peek behind the scenes about what happens when the query runs. Let's open up Profiler, click Connect. And in my profiler trace, what I want to do is I'm going to use a blank trace and I'm going to select some events that will tell me what happens inside the engine, the analysis services engine. I'm going to choose the query begin and end events. They're the events that are fired when a, a DAX query begins and ends. And I'm going to select the direct query begin and end event. Anytime I see a direct query begin and end event, then direct query stuff is happening. And I'm going to also choose the Vertipak SE begin and end events. Anytime I see this, there are Vertipak storage engine things happening, which means in this case, direct link mode is happening. So let's click run. And let's go back to the browser and let's create a new report. So. There's the table, there's the view. Let's just build a table visual. And let's just choose some columns from the table. There we go, country and product. There. Let's see what's happened in Profiler. So some stuff has happened, but ooh, we've got direct query begin and end events. Does this mean that I've fallen back to direct query? No, it doesn't. Because if we have a look at these events, what's the SQL here? This is the semantic model checking the permissions on the SQL endpoint. So it's got to run the first time some SQL queries to see, is there any row level security or object level security defined? Well, if not, then you know, we can carry on and use direct lake mode. And then here, are all of the Vertipak storage engine events, which prove that the data has been loaded into memory, and now it's working just like any other import mode semantic model. If we get rid of this and we go back to the browser, let's create a, another table here, but let's go to the view and drag exactly the same columns in. Let's go country and sales on here. And if we have a look here in Profiler, we don't see any Vertipak events whatsoever. And if we have a look at these direct query begin and end events, we've got the same permissions checks. But down here, there is a SQL query that does a 
group by to get the data that we were using in that visual. So that's a direct query event. There are other ways of working out how and why you've fallen back to direct query. Um, some of my colleagues have got things uh, wrapped up nicely in a script. But if we go back to here, there is a DMV that you can run from DAX, Queer, uh, sorry, DAX Studio against your semantic model called Delta Table, Met Delta Table Metadata Storages. Um, people have started to talk about this. Uh, I've been told I can't blog about it yet because there are going to be some changes happening in the future, but I can talk about it in a session like this. If I run this DMV, There we go. It brings back some stuff. But if we have a look over here, there is a fallback reason column. One row for every table or view in my semantic model. If this fallback reason column is zero, I can use direct lake mode. I haven't used any features that I'm not allowed to use. If it's something other, like this too, which is the view, this tells me why I've had to fall back. And this too, in this case, means that I've actually got a view here that I can't use. So I can do that and I can find out why I've fallen back. There is actually also a property on the semantic model that you can set if you've got tabular editor, which is called direct lake behavior mode. If you don't change it. The automatic is what we've just seen. You know, you start with the direct lake semantic model and it'll fall back as necessary. But maybe you want to do some testing. You want to see, well, you know, I'm going to load in different amounts of data. I want to check whether direct lake mode is possible. You can set this property to direct lake only, which forces the engine to only use direct lake mode and it will return an error if it can't. So it's a nice, easy way of checking if you're like breaching any of these guardrails. You can also set it to direct query mode only, which forces the semantic model to be only direct query mode, which again is a good way of testing to see what the performance would be like if you've had to fall back. Last of all, uh, what's, well, that's a five. All right, yeah, I knew I was gonna get close. A few last things to talk about with internals. Something you will hear about a lot with direct lake mode is something called V order. V order is an optimization that we at Microsoft have for compressing data in Delta. It is not a change to the Delta format. The Delta tables that we create can be read by anybody. It is just a compression algorithm. It's basically the same compression algorithm that we use to compress data in import mode when the data gets loaded into an import mode semantic model. Except that we've taken that algorithm and we've put it into data flows, Gen 2, pipelines, anything that can load data into one lake. Only Microsoft has V order. Other people might be able to compress their semantic models, but we think that V order will achieve a better range of compression. But more importantly, remember that guardrail slide with number of row groups, you know, all of those different things. V ordering will try and create something which is optimized for direct lake mode. So compression isn't everything, number of row groups and all of these other different things to do with your delta format, that is also important for direct lake performance. So V order will kind of guarantee you the best possible direct lake performance. You can use direct lake on any Delta table. You can do a shortcut out to ADLS Gen 2 or AWS or whatever. You've got Delta tables there. You can still use direct lake mode and it will work. It's just that if you've got a direct lake, sorry, a, a Delta table that has had V order applied to it, the performance in direct lake mode will be better. And to get that, you have to use a fabric workload. Last big thing to talk about, refresh. Now, I said that refresh is still a thing, but refresh is not refresh in import mode. Refresh 
for a semantic model in direct lake mode will generally only take about 30 seconds at most. And refresh does something different to what you had before. Refresh does something called framing. With Delta, you have the ability to kind of take versions of your data. You load some data in, you've got that data. You delete the data. It doesn't really delete the data, but it kind of says, I've got you know, data deleted. You load some new data in, delete that data. Every time you do that, you create a new version of the data. Refresh with direct lake mode simply says, sync up my direct lake semantic model to the latest version of the data in that delta table. So it just says, give me the, mo give me the latest data. By default, the semantic models that could create, get created for a lake house, for example, will refresh automatically any time a change gets detected. You can create a custom semantic model, like I said, and you can turn off that automatic refresh as well for the default semantic model. Why would you want to do this? Well, let's imagine you're loading some dimension tables, you're loading some um, you know, fact tables, you probably don't want your Power BI reports to show the latest version of the data as they're available in these individual tables. You want the Power BI reports to show the latest version of the data only when all of your ETL is finished. So in that situation, you'd probably want to turn off you know, automatic refresh and just do a manual refresh after you've done everything. You can do a refresh fairly easily from um, a notebook now with something called Semantic Link, Senpai. Um, Coming soon, at some point in the future, you'll be able to do a refresh from uh, a pipeline as well, ADF. So that's what refresh is. But like I said, if you think about the direct delta table contents on the left and your DAX query results on the right, you start off with an empty delta table, you run a DAX query, you get an empty table back. You load the data in, the DAX query still returns nothing because I haven't refreshed to get to the latest version of the data. Do the refresh. Semantic model says, yes, we'll have version one of the data. You load some more data in, refresh, you get the latest version of the data. You load some more data in, you refresh, you get the latest version of the data. You delete all of the data. Your DAX query still shows you all of that data, not because it's got it held in memory, but because you haven't actually deleted it yet in the delta table. You do the refresh and the data disappears. I think I've run out of time. That's it. One more tiny bonus thing. Remember I said that the data gets loaded in on demand? You can see that happening. There is a DMV that you can run that can tell you which columns have been loaded into memory and how hot they are. How often are they used? Let's go back to DAX Studio. And here is a DMV called Discover Storage Table Segments. I'm going to run this on a semantic model that I have not used. Come on. That's not. Come on, come on, come on. All right, I might need to refresh this first. Let's go back to here, save, uh, and let's go to refresh demo. I'm going to refresh this. This should be nice and quick. There are some cases, there are some issues at the moment where you'll get um, fall back to direct query mode if you haven't actually done a refresh because it's confused about the framing. I think that's might be what we've hit there, but let me reconnect again. Connection might have timed out actually as well. I've gone over time. And go back to refresh demo. Run this, there we go. All right, so there are ways of kind of linking up and telling you what's going on here, but 
temperature is completely blank. There's nothing loaded into memory. If I go to this semantic model and build a new report, and let's go to create report. Let's choose the one column in here called row counter, load it in. There we are. It's been loaded into memory. We go back to DAX Studio, run this, and there we are. We've got three segments for the same column, and the temperature is 9.65. And you can see when it was last accessed. Now, this temperature starts decreasing if I don't use the column. So this value was 9.656. Run this again. It's 0 0.9456. That temperature is going to carry on decreasing. And that is what allows the engine to know whether it can safely page something out. Because, you know, maybe there's one column that somebody's loaded in, but it's not used very frequently. And perhaps we're thinking about how we can juggle memory. Maybe that column could be paged out and something else could be paged in. If I refresh the report, though, we'll be able to go back to here, uh, Stack Studio, and rerun it. And it will be, uh, should have gone up a little bit. But you get the idea. So that's all I wanted to say. Um, there is a lot more that you can go into with Direct Lake, but hopefully this gives you a good initial first look at it, why it's important, why it's exciting, why it's useful. Please go away, start a fabric trial if you haven't done so already, copy some data into one lake and start playing around with direct lake mode, you will be pleasantly surprised. Like I said, the performance is not as good as import mode, but it is quite often good enough, a lot better than direct query mode, and there are a lot of interesting benefits to using it. So play around with it. Let me know how you get on. Start buying some fabric capacities, putting it in production, and um, paying my salary indirectly. <laughs> Thanks a lot.